The inspector Mines commented that it looks as though the explosion had travelled through the tunnels and after about 25 yards of reaching the early scene workings it fizzled out because of the nature of the coal uh, and the nature of the dust produced from the early seam. It wasn't as combustible, um, which was lucky for those men. There were 500 and, well, there were 890 men underground in total at the time of their disaster. 545 men were in the early and other workings, so they were the survivors. So it could have been, it could have been one of the Round about the third largest mining disaster in world mining history, if all 890 had died. As it was, three, often the figure is 344 for the men killed here. It's actually 343. Uh, a man who went down with the rescue team also died. That's how it became 344. Right. So I'll just play the recording of the man who survived. It's very interesting because uh, there's some very fascinating for me Lancashire dialect as well. You're probably better in, if you're in line with the speakers, uh, if you come round. Usually about halfway through the helicopter comes over. <laughs> uh, I don't know what he's doing, he must have been delayed. No better off. And I want to do Cine cameramen came. Oh, somebody shouts. It's a wrong point. So this is the man reminiscing. Uh, he's underground in the early scene workings and they've heard some sort of dull thud in the distance or even a blast. And being experienced miners, they know something's wrong and they're wondering if there's been a big roof collapse or there's been an explosion. A fella says, no wrong point. There's something serious here. He says, come on, get your clues on, let's get bit. First bit of uh, classic dialect there, get the cluers on. <laughs> and I'm sure some of the older people here remember the grandparents saying, get the cluers on. <laughs> it's interesting when you have children coming on a guided walk and you, you say, what do you reckon that is? Cluers. They have no idea. What's that? Clothes. Clothes. Yeah. Right. I can understand Argentinians not understand. <laughs> no. No. It's, a bit, it's difficult even for <laughs> Lancastrians. Bottom and shaft. That's here. Well, my lamp had gone out. I had no light. So his miner's lamp had gone out because as the blast had gone through the workings it had shaken his lamp and the miner's lamp slightly shaken to go out. So anyway, we got to bottom and shaft. We come up and oh. up to the all machinery was stopped. We're all finished. We're nothing going. Yeah. And we can feel the air, you know, going worse and worse. He says, there's no air coming, one fella says. Come on, he says, let's get moving. Anyway, we got to Big Bottom. Oh, yeah. Well, we got to Big Bottom, now I've seen such a shambling in my life. There were no, no cages, they were stuck in the shaft. And boss were there, somebody says, what's new, Jack? That was the Jack Buller. He says, I don't know what's new. He says, I can't find anything out. He says, there's no telephones, there's nothing. All lights is gone. All lights in between or nothing. That's interesting when he said, uh, at the bottom of the shaft, the old term in mining, going back centuries, at the bottom of a shaft was the pit, pit, eye because at the bottom of the shaft you could see a chink of daylight and it was termed the eye of the day in a sense. Mm -hmm. So the corruption of that in dialect was pit een E-E-N, pit -een. So the, the inside the pit box said the pit -een. Let up, phones have gone, they can't get no nothing. Well, you see, all up front of where the cage comes down, it's all caged in, you see, you know, like, doors, you know, wooden doors. Well, all them were blown away. And down at the bottom, they, they were wire open and all sorts. I fancy they were guide rods. I was taking them from big guide rods. 
Those are the metal cables that uh, kept the cage straight in the shaft because you had two cages in the shaft, one would be at the top of the shaft, one at the bottom and they would pass halfway through so you didn't want them colliding. So at the corner of the cage uh, there'd be a metal cable running the full length of the shaft so it would run down and be kept in a straight line. But they'd been hit, damaged by the explosion, they were all tangled up at the bottom of the shaft. So then the men are worrying, are they ever going to be able to wind the cage down to get us out? The cage will come down, you see. Anyway, the, we were about nearest to that big bottom of our goldfish were than any of the others. Here we are. <laughs> I think that's them. Well, we're about first lot getting down to it. So these men are at the bottom of this shaft, they've come out of the early workings and there's still gas around but they're still alive and they can hear somebody higher up the shaft <laughs> shouting for help. So another fifth, well about 80 foot higher up the shaft there were two side tunnels in other workings and the men in those workings had come to the edge of the shaft and they were shouting down uh, to the men at the bottom for help, they were hoping to be wound out. Help, help! Bully shouted up to him. Yes, and some help wanted down here too. <laughs> so Buller was the under manager. He deputised for the manager underground. Well, anyway, this was early grew worse and worse, you know. And I was feeling groggy. But anyway, there were men started to get coming in from other districts, you know, into fit and fit and then Buller said, "Now all you was is all right." He says, help them as you can't help yourself. He says, there's men, there's men here, they want good sleep. Don't let them go to sleep. It don't punch them, do anything at them. Don't let them go to sleep. Well, there are Palamani he come out uh, to another district. And, and then I see him, I says, now, George, come on, don't go to sleep. Oh, let me go. He said, I said, no, let me go. So his mate came out of the workings and, and he said he looked a bit groggy and he sat down uh, and he was going to go to sleep and that's the danger with carbon monoxide poison you've got to keep breathing flush the gas out but breathe your best you can if you nod off you're, you'll have, have got to die in your sleep suffocate in a sense so he he said uh, to his mate keep away or the mum whacking up um, and his mate used an old term there for letting me die let me go over let me go over you know to the next dimension or heaven or whatever. Up, keep up, keep up. Anyway we seem to be down there hours and hours, you know, and couldn't find nothing now. And at last we had, we had a cage coming down. Very so eventually they managed uh, to get one of the cages in this shaft, travelling the shaft. The other one was stuck. Uh, so they detached the winding rope on one half of the winding drum that fed the other cage and they were able to wind a single cage up and down here. It was only two decks and you could only get around about 12 men in each deck. Yet there were 545 men waiting to come out. Slow, you know. Mm -hmm. Cage lunch to the bottom and I'll never forget this. Mm -hmm. Every pushing for it, you see. Then I don't, I, I think his name was Dix. I think he was general manager of West Halton Coal and Channel Coal. There were another Dixon, H.O. Dixon, Bravo, it wasn't H.O. Dixon. There were a Dixon before it. I'll never forget. He said, now let's all be British. Which they did, and they all fell back, and they all out, out forget this, these lot of them. They, they started getting younger lads for, out first, you know, because they were crying, some of them, you know. It's a fascinating thing, the young lads there, 14, 15, 16 year old, uh, terrified what's happened to them, they heard a big, big explosion, the thought of men being killed and they're, they're actually crying. On third we're going worse and worse and then I finished they got, they had a surface fan you know, they got that going, well it got better then, they were starting to come in better. 
So the problem at Pretoria had been by design. They had a number of fans pushing the air around the workings. They had five fans underground. Instead of you having one big fan on the surface that sucked air out of one of the shafts, they decided to rely on what they called booster fans pushing air around the workings. So most of those had been damaged after the explosion, which was a bit of a design flaw really. So they got the, uh, the secondary fan on the surface going, which was about 50 yards in that direction, and that was pulling air out of number three shaft. And by doing so, fresh air was going down this shaft and round the workings. You know how they, get, how they got them on, didn't you? <coughs> There's no signals, you know, to wind her. They had a big iron plate. On this other tower, our bottom, where out we were, he were hitting that. To the trenchy bowl man, dial up. Trenchy bowl man were hitting it to the surface. A man up top leaning over listening. So, because the signalling equipment had uh, been damaged, um, at the bottom of this shaft, when they wanted the case to be wound up, the man at the bottom had a big metal plate and a hammer, and he would hit it three times. In mining, three is always the signal for wind up, two is to go down. So he'd hit it three times, and a man farther up the shaft would hear that uh, three, three knocks. He then would do the same at his inset, and then the man on the surface here would be listening, he'd hear three, and he'd shout to the man in the engine house over there, I'm pointing the wrong road, there, there's the engine house, uh, it, or he would knock three, and he would start winding the cage up slowly. So it was a, a long process for the 545 men who had to wait hours, hours before they came to the surface. Now it's interesting recently with the centenary of the end of the First World War um, that a famous war, First World War poet, some of you might have heard of him, Wilfred Owen, yeah, yeah uh, came from a mining district in Shropshire and um, he had involvement with mining as well, ending up an officer in the First World War with a Mantis regiment a lot of the men under his command were from this area, Lee Allison, Tilsley, Wigan, Henley, Aspel, outskirts of Manchester as well, from mining districts. Initially, uh, in his diaries, he said he thought they were a bunch of thugs and barbarians. But then he saw them in action and realised how, how the strength of character, possibly from the mining sort of background. Uh, he was injured by a bomb, uh, a shell blast, and while he was convalescing in 1916, he wrote a poem about miners. Apparently he was sat there looking in the fire, and some of the older people here will remember when you were little, looking in the fire, thinking you can see like little shapes or dragons and caverns and things like that. So he's looking in the fire, uh, and he's thinking also of the men he's seen dead in the trenches, and he's, it's a sort of, sound like a teacher here, compare and contrast men in the trenches, the bodies, men underground being killed after mining disasters so uh, it's called miners and he won a he, he won a prize for it actually so let's play that miners by wilfred owen sounds a bit quieter than the other there was a whispering in my half a sigh of the coal grown wistful of a former earth it might recall i listened for a tale of leaves and smothered ferns, frond forests, and the low, sly lives before the fawns. My fire might show steam phantoms simmer from time's old cauldron, before the birds made nests in summer, or men had children. But the coals were murmuring of their mine, and moans down there, of boys that slept wry sleep, and men writhing for air. And I saw white bones in the cinder shard, bones without number. Many of the muscled bodies charred, and few remember. I thought of some who worked dark pits of war, and died digging the rock where death reputes peace, lies indeed. Comforted years will sit soft chaired in rooms of amber. The years will stretch their hands well cheered by our lives ember. The centuries will burn rich loads with which we groan, 
whose warmth shall lull their dreaming lids while songs are crooned. But they will not dream of us poor lads left in the ground. Well, that's an interesting connection with uh, the First World War, Wilfred Owen, and the mining disaster as well. So, uh, so this is the shaft, number four pit, where the bodies were brought up with single winding. Uh, and it was to be a good three or four hours before the last men arrived at the top of this shaft. Uh, some men were brought up unconscious by the time they were unconscious when they arrived at the surface and they had to carry out CPR, if that's the right initials, of those men to revive them. Um, some of the bodies that arrived on the surface were unidentifiable, so Police Sergeant Brown documented everybody that arrived on the surface, some of which he knew visually, others he just documented their possessions, such as a key, a tram ticket, or whatever or a pocket watch and that proved to be very useful when they came to identify some of the men who were so badly they were burned beyond recognition ones who'd been close to the blast um, so that was very useful some men were only identified by a, a darn sock or something like that a lady would come along and rest, recognize straight away oh yeah that's my billy or whatever that's the sock i darned a few days ago so uh, the bodies arrived on the surface, they went into a temporary mortuary, I keep pointing the wrong road again, at the back of the engine house, where some of the pit brown women cleaned up the bodies, obviously covered in coal dust, and made them more presentable. And people arrived then to identify bodies, the bodies then would be taken away by a locomotive to check a bent where the various funeral uh, contractors would then take the bodies away. Did they get all the bodies out? Pardon? Did they get all uh, the bodies out? There was one body that was never found. And I spoke to a man who worked here until it closed in 1934. I met him in the 1980s. And he said some uh, uh, remains of a body. I think he said it, it really was just a low part of an arm. And he said the hand was like a mummified hand, you know, like an Egyptian mummy sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said at the time, the colliery manager came down. Uh, and he said, right, get rid of it. Don't, nobody here has got to mention that we found this because the coroner would have had to be brought in. Coal production would have stopped, etc. Uh, so he said it was kept a secret amongst all the men who were underground on surface as well, that they found these remains and they left them underground. So uh, it's interesting, the Inspector Mines report, uh, he was very thorough, the Inspector of Mines, John Jarrod, uh, it's recorded that on one day he spent 16 hours underground trying to figure out the course of events underground <clears throat> and he managed to document where men had been working at the, before the explosion took place and where the bodies were found after. So some of the men right in the distance, like 2,000 yards away, uh, had time to walk nearly 100 yards before the carbon monoxide fumes overcame them. Um, at modern mines today, the ones that are left, men have a self-rescuer on them and it uh, absorbs carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Um, so uh, you've a chance today, if there is an explosion, to get to what they call a fresh air base. Uh, but in those days, the bulk of the men died through carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, right, any more How questions? How deep this shaft on? Pardon? How deep was this shaft? This shaft's 350 yard deep. So this is a cap in. The shaft is open underneath. They didn't fill these shafts in after it closed in 1934. Atherton Collieries workings were to the south and they felt it was a better idea that they left these shafts unfilled um, so that the water underground would take its natural course through the strata and not affect the workings, for instance, at Chanter's Colliery to the south. Uh, so that was the way in those days. They didn't want uh, sort of water problems being caused by yeah. filling the shaft here and the water then yeah. being pent up. So, right, I keep looking the wrong way. <coughs>